أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful The one who has created everything in utmost perfection And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger The peak of his creation The symbol of humanity the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, ajrallahu ta'ala farajah, may Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Holy Quran to honor our contracts. Awfu bil uqud. A very clear verse in the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to uphold the contracts and transactions that we, that we make with each other. We could not live a functional life without contracts, without transactions. Because whenever you want to enter into a transaction, whether it's a sale, whether it's renting, whether it's a construction job, whatever it is, you need to know the conditions and the rights. What are my rights in this transaction? What are your rights in this transaction? What are the conditions that we have to fulfill and observe? Without knowing the conditions of a transaction, that's recipe for disputes, for tension. That's recipe for disaster. You can't trust anyone. You need to make sure that the contract comes with clear terms, clear conditions. That way you know how to proceed. And if the other side violates the contract, you know how to respond. You can take them to court. You can, you know, in, 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 in the past, you can go to the, for instance, elders of the community or the village and ask them to resolve the dispute. Or you'd go to a judge in the area and he would resolve the dispute. So having contracts secures our rights. Now, what is the most important contract you make throughout your life? Yes, marriage. Exactly, you know. Marriage is the most important contract that you make in your life. Marriage is a contract, by the way. That's why in Islamic law, it's called aqdu zawaj. Aqd means contract. That is the most important contract you will make in your life because it's a lifelong contract. When you rent a place, you might rent it for a year, two years. Okay, you don't like it, you leave. Same with a sale of a house, building, item in your store. But the marital contract is one that will impact your life for decades, potentially. So it is by far the most important contract that affects your life. Now, many of us enter this contract without knowing the terms and conditions. What are the conditions of this contract? What are my obligations? What are the terms? Now, there are default conditions that come with any marriage contract. In addition to the default conditions, you can add your own contracts. As long as they don't violate the law of Allah, you can add any, any, any condition that you want. These are my terms. Do you want to get married? If the other side accepts, it's valid in the eyes of Allah. Awfu bil uqud. Al mu'minuna inda shurutihim. Honor your contracts, honor your conditions. Now, historically, scholars would advise people who wanted to get married to go by the default rights that come in an Islamic contract. When it comes to divorce, the dowry, how the wealth is going to be distribute, distributed in case of divorce, for instance, the custody of the children, this comes by default in Islamic law. And therefore, scholars historically said to the people, their advice to the people was, 
it's, it's better to stick to the default. You can add your own conditions, but you don't have to. The default that Islam has given us is probably the best for us. So let's just go with the default. Today, our society has changed. Today, many of us are not familiar with what the default conditions are. And secondly, even if we later come to know them, we violate them. When I look at divorce cases these days, and the divorce rate is extremely high, exceeding 50% in some communities. I'm talking about Muslim communities. In some Muslim communities in North America, it's exceeding 50%. And that's truly alarming. It's a source of concern for us. When I examine these divorce cases, I see that the majority of the time, there are violations of Islamic law. Violations of conditions are always being committed in our communities. Either because they're not aware of them or they don't care about them. They don't want these conditions. They want other conditions when divorce comes, for instance. So it's very important for us, my dear brothers and sisters, to understand the default laws that come with marriage. And the important part of our discussion tonight, what five conditions do I personally recommend Many of you put in your contracts. Some of you might be getting married. Some of you have children who might be getting married. Some of you might have grandchildren who might be getting married. So this discussion benefits all of us to understand how this contract works and what are the five conditions that I recommend you put. Now, normally I wouldn't recommend these five. I would say go by default Islamic law. But because I see so many people are committing haram are violating the law of Allah because they do not observe this contract, I have no choice but to make this recommendation for you. Let's examine these five conditions briefly. The first one, according to Islamic law by default, in case of divorce, when the husband and the wife, they get divorced, what are they entitled to? The wife is entitled to the mu'akhar of the dowry, if in giving her the dowry, he said, I will give you the last part of the dowry upon death or divorce. When divorce happens, the husband is obligated to give her the dowry if he hasn't already. Is she entitled to anything more than the dowry from his money, from his assets? According to default Islamic law, she's not entitled to that. She's only entitled to the dowry. If she wants a dime more than the dowry, she has to put it in the contract. When she gets married, she can put any condition. In case there is divorce, God forbid, I want one third of your assets. I want half of your assets. I will put a condition that you will gift me half of your assets. If this is what you have in mind or this is what you expect, put it as a condition when you do your Islamic marriage. Because, because if you do not, and you take more than the dowry, sisters, please allow me to say this. This is Islamic law. It's haram money. There is no difference between you going and breaking into your neighbor's house and stealing their money and taking more than the dowry from your husband if he's not okay with, him, with it. According to Islamic law, this is haram money. That's not money that you're entitled to. So if you take him to court, and you force him to pay that. Yes, the law allows you to do that. But in Allah's law, that's a violation. That's a sin. Allah will hold you accountable for that. That is haram money. It's just as haram as stealing from someone. Please allow me to say that. This is Islamic law. You want more than that? You can. Put it. Put it as a condition. I will get married on the condition that I get, inshallah, not 50, 98% of your wealth. Whatever you want to agree with him. Put it as a condition. <laughs> so it's very important to be aware of this now there are two points about this condition the first point a wife will say say it i spent 20 years raising the children at home he went he made his money i only get the dowry that's not fair now there are multiple responses to that but the most important spiritual response to that is you when you sacrificed in the house you did so for the sake of Allah. Allah will reward you. One day, 
a lady by the name of Asma Al Ansariya. She was a well known lady in Medina and she was good at debating and speaking. One day she came to the Prophet and she objected. She said, Ya Rasulullah, it's not fair. You men have the opportunity to go to the battle and defend Islam. And if you get killed, you become a martyr, shaheed. But we women don't have this honor. That's not fair. The Prophet told her, if you in your house, you protect yourself, you protect your children, your family, you work hard, Allah will give you the reward of a shaheed. Don't underestimate the reward Allah will give you. So don't think that you didn't get anything out of these 20 years. You did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate you. Secondly, if the wife contributed to the house, because that's a common scenario these days, the wife also works. So let's say they bought a home together. She put 50,000, he put 100,000. That 50,000 is her money. If she put that 50,000 from her money upon divorce, Islamically, she has the right to that. So yes, the money that you put, you can claim it. It's your money. You put it in the house. And that's what justice necessi necessitates. But if the house was purchased by the husband's money, upon divorce, you only are entitled to the dowry as the wife. Anything more than the dowry must be by his permission. He has to willingly give it. And he should. Morally, he should. Ethically, he should compensate her more. But can I force him to give me that extra money? I cannot force him. Doing so is haram money. And do you really want haram money in your life? I see this happening every day. Every day, the wife takes the husband to the court. She takes half of his assets. And he's not okay with that. That is haram money in the law of Allah. Unless you made a contract. If you made that condition, it's your halal money. So that's why I recommend to the younger generation who are getting married today, put this condition. Not because I support women getting half of the assets of their husbands, but because I know most of you will end up violating this and you will eat haram money in your life. I don't want that for you. I do not want that for your children, for your grandchildren. So just put that condition. And that, and that way, if you wanted half of his money, it's your hala. Allah will not hold you accountable. Through this way, you avoid committing a sin in Islamic law. So I don't necessarily recommend this condition because marriage is based on love and mutual respect. It's not a business where how much will I get money out of it or not. But the reality is many are making a violation. And I don't want you to make these violations. So I recommend the first condition is this condition. As decide on how the assets are going to be split. The day you get married, go and decide that. Once you decide that in your Islamic marriage, go to the prenuptial in the court. That way, legally, you're also covered. This is the first condition. The second condition that I also recommend you discuss in your Islamic marriage contract before you get officially married is the custody of the children. Islamic law has specified what the custody is. We have hadiths about that. Now scholars have different fatwas because of their understanding of the hadith. But for instance, some of the great maraja' today, well-known maraja' today, their fatwa is the first two years of the child's life in case of divorce, both parents have custody. It's shared custody. After two years, the custody is for the father. Meaning he has the right to the custody if he demands that right. Now, does this mean that if the father has the custody of the children over two years, does it mean that the mother can't see the children? Of course not. She's the mother. She always has access to her children. But he has the havana, the custody. This is according to a number of maraji' whose fatwa is this. Several other maraji' based on one hadith that we have, they say no. The boy... Two years and older, it's the husband's custody. But the girl under seven, it's the mother's custody. She has the greater right to it. After seven years old, the father has the greater right to the custody. So there are some differences between how scholars understand how custody works. But this is the default. If you don't want to go by this default, specify what you want to go by. In case of divorce and we have children, what kind of custody are we going to have? 
Specify that. You make that in your contract. Agree on it the day you get married. Do I want shared custody until they get older and adults and they make decisions for themselves? You decide whatever works best for you. And shared custody is normally the best. So it's very important to understand what the default is. Now I know some of you are wondering, why is that fair? How come Islam gave the custody to the father? Historically, the guardianship, the guardianship belonged to the father, the husband. He would be working. Financially, he would be suitable to take care of the children. Historically, the wife could not, the mother could not. So Islam founded in the interest of the children to have the father take the custody because he could care for their financial well-being better than the mother because he had the financial power to do so. The wife historically did not have that financial power. So Islam found it in the interest of children to have the father take, take the custody, even though shared custody is recommended. But if the father in Islamic law says, I want the custody after two years, or after seven years for the girls, according to some fatwas, that's his right. I cannot take him to court and do otherwise unless I have a contract, unless I've done my Islamic condition. So this is the second condition that I recommend. So we do not end up making violations in Islamic law. Agree on what type of custody you'll want. Now there are exceptions, of course. Islamic law states if the father is unfit. Some fathers are unfit. I've seen that, believe me. If the father is unfit to raise the children, he's abusive, he's aggressive, for instance, of course, in that case, the mother takes the children. But we're talking about a normal case where the father is fit to raise the children and be their father. That would be the default. So if you have a problem with that default, that's fine. Allah's not forcing you before you get married. You can put your own condition. As long as you put your own condition, you're, you're good to go. So this is the second condition that I recommend you put in your marriage contract. The third condition, according to Islamic law and hadiths and the fatwa of the majority of scholars, a wife cannot leave the house without the permission of the husband. I know you have mixed feelings about that. I am stating to you Islamic law. And my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to at least appreciate one thing. Our role is not to sit on the mimbar and appease anyone or please anyone. Our role is to convey the law of Allah as we understand it. The Sahih Hadith does state that. That the wife cannot leave the house without the permission of the husband. It doesn't mean she goes and begs for permission every time. No. But if he says that, I don't give you permission to go, she has to respect that. Unless he's abusive. Unless he's abusive. Unless he's threatening her with physical force. Unless he's saying that just to seek revenge and punish her for nothing. These are exceptions. We're not talking about the exceptions. The default is that she cannot leave the house without his permission. Sisters, do you have a problem with that? Be honest, come on. Let me see one of you raise your hands if you have a problem with that. Okay, you have a problem with that? No problem. Put that in your marriage contract. Put in your marriage contract, I will get married and my condition is that I leave the house whenever I want. I leave my house. Okay, too late? Maybe with your children you can fix that. <laughs> too late for some of them, right? This is the default. We don't want to make violations of Islamic law, but I see that this is a problem today. Now husbands, don't be abusive. A husband who does not want his wife to leave the house for no legitimate reason, that's being unethical. You know, there's a beautiful verse in the Quran if we just remember it every day. Allah states, وَعَشُرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Allah is commanding men, live decently with your wives. Live decently. Don't be difficult. Don't complicate things. Have a wonderful, decent life. When Allah describes the marital relationship in the Holy Quran, Allah states, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Allah has created partners for yourselves, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So you find peace, you find tranquility. Some husbands, no. They want to exercise their authority and power. Let me show her who's boss. No, let her sit today. Why? Kefi. I want it that way. 
You're not following the Quran. The Quran says, وَعَشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Be decent. Yes, if you have a legitimate concern, she's going someplace you think it's unsafe, it's causing a family problem. If it's a valid reason, fine. You can tell her, I'm not okay with you, for instance, leaving the house for these reasons. But for you just to be aggressive and toxic and abusive, that's not acceptable in the law of Allah. Men also have to understand that because I see some shabab getting married today. Yeah, Allah has given me the right. I can control her. Leave now, don't leave now. Leave now. No, she's not a robot that you control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the well-being of the family. And so maybe sometimes the wife leaving could cause some concerns. And given that men historically in society had more experience with dangers in society, with concerns with families, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the husband this right. So if you're okay with the default, may Allah bless you sisters. If you're not okay with it, put it in your contract. Once you put it in your contract, you can leave without the husband's permission. And before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be committing a sin. I also recommend you put this condition because I see in marital problems, always this comes up. And we're making violations, we're committing sins, it's better without it. So I would rather stick to the default because the default that Allah gives us is the best for us. Allah knows what's good for us. But if I know I'm not going to stick to the default, put a condition. That way at least you don't commit haram. At least you don't violate the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the third condition, my dear brothers and sisters, that I recommend. The fourth condition that I recommend, and it's really an extension of this, is the right of the husband to in intimacy. According to Islamic law, the wife is obligated to make herself available to the husband unless she had a medical concern, unless it's going to harm her, she has an illness, that's an exception. Otherwise, look at the fatwa of scholars, they say it is mandatory on her. If she doesn't, she's committing a sin. Okay, if you're okay with that, stick to the default. If you're not okay with that, put that as a condition in your marital contract that I will determine that. It must be with my permission. By the way, when I'm having this discussion with you, I am not here having a legal discussion on what's legal in your society. That's a different story. Someone can come and say, Sayyid, are you encouraging us to violate the law? Here, if the woman says no, it's a no. She's your wife, she's not, it doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the legal effects. We respect the laws of our society. We respect the law of the land and we don't cause trouble in the law of the land. But I am discussing with you the religious aspect here. The religious aspect is that she cannot say no unless she has a valid concern like a medical concern. If she's not okay with that, put that in your contract. That it must be with my full permission. You are allowed to put that in your contract. So put it and avoid the disputes in the future and avoid committing religious violations. So this is very important, my dear brothers and sisters. This is the fourth recommendation that I have for you over here in order for us to avoid having disputes, in order for us to avoid violating the law of Allah. This marriage is a contract and you can put these conditions that you want. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The fifth condition, and this one is a really important one. The right to divorce. In Islamic law, by default, who has the right to initiate divorce? The husband. It's very clear in our Islamic hadiths. The Quran doesn't specify that, but in our hadith, Sunni and Shia have both agreed that the right to divorce belongs to the husband. He has the right to initiate divorce. The wife does not have the right to initiate divorce. The only circumstances in which she can request for a divorce when the husband is not allowing to divorce is if he's not spending on her or he's being abusive, physically let's say abusive, and he's not stopping, she can raise her case to the office of any marja any hakim al-shar'i, any mujtahid jurist, 
And if he verifies that indeed her case is legitimate, the marja can issue the divorce. But this usually is a lengthy process. I'll be honest with you. It's not an easy process. Let's say a wife, her husband is not spending on her. He's being abusive. She contacts the office of the marja. They have to call him. They have to verify that he indeed is abusive. They'll need evidence. They'll need proof. Back and forth. Give him another chance. Let's pressure him to stop. Sometimes it could be a difficult process to get that. But that is a way out. We do have hadiths about that. So by default, the husband has the right to divorce. Sisters, are you okay with this condition? <laughs> Some of you may not be okay with that. Some sisters are like, why? What's the difference between me and the husband? If he has the right to initiate divorce, I, ha I should also have the right to initiate divorce. I don't want to live with him. I want to get divorced for whatever reason. Let me get divorced. Why do I need his permission for him to initiate the divorce? So if you're okay with it, that's fine. Go by the default. If you're not okay with it. By the way, there is wisdom historically in Allah putting the right of divorce in the hands of a husband. There is wisdom behind that. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to get divorced easily like that without a valid reason. But at the same time, we're not like Catholics who say there's no divorce, you're stuck. Catholicism historically believed that divorce is not valid, it's haram. You marry someone, you live with them for the rest of your life, even if they're abusive. Recently, churches have realized that this is not sustainable, so they're trying to make exceptions. But in in Catholic law, there's no divorce. Now, Islam is a practical religion. No, sometimes you may need to get divorced. There are special circumstances when it's better to get divorced. Islam recognized that. So Islam wanted to give the right of divorce. Now, if you give it to both of them, that's not the best. Why? Because it makes divorce so much easier and accessible. And this was not in the interest of families throughout history. Now, why did Islam choose the husband and not the wife? Not because the husband is better than the wife. No, not because of that. Don't think that if Islam gives you a legal right, it means that person who has the right is better. That's never the case. It's because it's more practical. There's a reason behind it. But one reason, and there are studies based on this. There are studies based on this. I'm not here you know, trying to perpetuate some stereotypes. Both men and women are emotional. We're emotional beings. If you're not an emotional being, you're a robot. You're chat GPT. You're not a human being, right? I myself, I'm an emotional being. So both are emotional. However, psychological studies have shown that women, when it comes to decision-making, they're more impacted by emotions than men. These are not my words. These are the words of scientists, psychologists. No, we're not saying women are emotional. We are emotional too. I, I, sitting on the member, I'm an emotional person. I'm not a human if I'm not emotional. I'm not a human if I'm not impacted by emotions. Rasulullah would be impacted by emotions. Look at the verses in the Holy Quran. وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ Ya Rasulullah, we know you get depressed. Your heart becomes tight because of what they say. فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُمْ Ya Rasulullah, don't be sorrowful. No, Rasulullah would have emotions. So both men and women are emotional beings. However, studies have shown that when we make decisions, and we are all impacted by emotions, who's not? But women are impacted by emotions more than men. So after a dispute, after a misunderstanding, if the woman has the right to initiate divorce, it's more likely for her to exercise that. Islam probably did not find it in the best interest of the family to have that. So Islam gave the right of divorce to the man, to the, man, to the husband. This is one wisdom behind it. There are other reasons as well. This is one that I wanted to share with you. So the default in Islamic law is that the right to divorce is in the hands of the husband. He can initiate it. If I have a problem with that, I don't like that, that's fine. In your marriage contract, the wife can put a condition that you will assign me as your wakil, as your authorized representative, 
And it's a wakala bila azl. It's an irrevocable wakala that I can initiate divorce on your behalf whenever I want. Can she put that in the contract? Yes, she can. And if she does, she can initiate divorce just like he can. But without it, you cannot. I know today some people, I'm talking about practicing families. They go to the court, get the divorce. Ma'asalama. I don't care you want me to go and to the masjid and get an Islamic divorce. I, I don't care about that. I live here in this country. I'm going to go with the court. Fine, go do the court things. That's fine. But your Islamic divorce has to be done according to Islamic law. If you didn't, you're not divorced. You're going and remarrying, but in reality, you're still the wife of that person. It's important for us to respect the laws of marriage and divorce in Islam. So a wife can specify that, that she is the wakil. Now, what do I personally recommend? I have another modification here. What I recommend for sisters who are concerned, maybe the husband one day is going to give me a hard time, he's not going to divorce me, when I have legitimate reasons to divorce, here's what I recommend. Because we're impacted by emotions and sometimes we might act not in our best interest, Sometimes, by the way, when you're under stress and pressure, you may not act in your own best interest. It's not just emotions, it's stress and, another, and, and, and other factors. So here's what I recommend. Instead of making divorce easier, and that may not be in your best interest for the wife to initiate it, I recommend that when you make a contract, appoint someone else to authorize the divorce. For instance, a local scholar. The wife can put in her marital contract, I marry you on the condition that I have the right to initiate divorce, meaning you give me the wakala, if the local scholar approves of it and he says, I have a valid reason. You can choose a community member that you trust. You believe in their judgment. You can say, we give him the wakala. So someone that both of you respect, Give them the wakala that way. If the husband is complicating things and the wife has a legitimate concern, this person, once he sees the legitimate concern, he can initiate the divorce without having to go to the long process of going to, other, to the office of a merja and getting a you know, divorce from Hakim al-Shari because that's a really lengthy process. So that would be my recommendation. Not to give the wakala entirely to the wife, Sometimes they're not, there may not be valid reasons. And sometimes there may be valid reasons. Have someone, objective, neutral, make that decision. This will ensure the well-being of your family. Because it does happen. My dear brothers and sisters, I've seen it. Many times it happens in our communities. The wife, the husband, he's fulfilling his obligations. He's really wonderful. He's a wonderful person. He's treating her well. She initiates divorce. And then when you kind of investigate why, I've seen this happening. One scenario is her father, the father of the woman, he brainwashed her to divorce him so they can get half of his assets by court. You don't think this happens? This is happening to so-called practicing, practicing families. It's happening. At least in this case, you can stop that, the Islamic divorce. No, that's not legitimate. You are getting divorced, not because he's abusive, not because he's a bad person, and you're breaking up this marriage, so you and your family go and take his money? That's unacceptable. That's immoral. That's unethical. Or sometimes she might fall in love with someone else and she wants to marry someone else, even though her husband is following his, ob you know, fulfilling his obligations. If he wants to divorce her, that's fine. If it's willing, but you cannot force him. That would not be a valid reason to force my husband to divorce me. Why? Because I met somebody at work. That's not acceptable. So my recommendation is, if you want to put this in your contract, it's better to assign someone, like an elder in your community, like a local scholar, anyone that you believe in their judgment, let them make the call. So you can take your case to them. If they say, yes, I see that it's a legitimate concern, then you can initiate divorce. That would guarantee the well-being of the family. So these are the five conditions that I personally recommend you put in your marriage contracts. 
If you're getting married, you know someone who's getting married, your children who are about to get married, your grandchildren, inshallah, in the future when they get married, make them aware. If they accept the default, tell them if you accept the default, stick to the default. Regardless of the circumstances and the disputes and the problems, stick to the default and honor it. If you don't think you can, put your condition right now. This would be better in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that way you don't make violations and you don't commit sins. But at the end of the day, my dear brothers and sisters, marriage is that dimension in our lives that allows us to grow. Sometimes we get stuck on problems, on fights in our marriages. We start to dehumanize each other. The biggest problem I see in divorce cases is that both sides stop seeing each other as human beings. You know what the Quran says in a beautiful verse? We have all disputes, right? Sometimes we get into disputes, misunderstanding. The Quran says, وَلَا تَنْسَوُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ I know some married couples, they have been married for 10 years, 20 years. Beautiful marriage. The wife sacrifices every day. The husband sacrifices. Now they have a dispute. They destroy one another. They engage in character assassination. They dehumanize one another. They attack one another. You're the worst person on earth. You forgot all those 20 years of sacrifice? Allah says, that's not fair. At least be decent. At least give each other credit. That's why I recommend whenever two people want to get divorced and it's done, that's it. There's no way to reconcile between them. At least what I would recommend to them, okay, now that you are divorcing, don't make it a nasty divorce. Thank one another, respect one another. You, the husband, tell your wife, tell your wife I thank you. For 20 years, you lived me, you stood by my side. Okay, we've been having problems last few years, but the first few years were good. Thank her. Appreciate that. And she should do the same. That's the instruction of the Quran. Don't forget the father, the goodness, the favors you have for each other. A mu'min is loyal. He never forgets the favors of other people. That's a quality of a true believer. I will be loyal to her, even if I have to separate right now, but at least I will acknowledge the goodness. I remember once I was counseling a couple, they wanted to get divorced. So I asked one of them to just remind them that they do have some good qualities. Because of this dispute, don't think there are no good qualities at all. So I asked one of them, can you name three good qualities about your husband, let's say. So she was thinking, she's like, say, he doesn't have a single good quality on earth. I told her, when she said that, you know what I told her? I told her, if he has zero good qualities, why did you marry him? I told her, did your parents force you to marry him? Was this an arranged marriage? She was like, no, Sayyid, it wasn't an arranged marriage. I'm like, okay. Why do you marry someone who has zero good qualities? It's your fault. If you really believe he has zero good qualities, it's your fault. Why'd you marry him? Who forced you to marry him? You just admitted nobody forced you to marry him. Did he beg you to marry him? No, Sayyid, he didn't beg me. My parents didn't force me. So why did you? So I told her, no, that's not being fair. He does have good qualities. Don't let this dispute blind you. Acknowledge these good qualities. And then sometimes when you talk to them and you are bringing reconciliation, they come to see, you know what? I wasn't being fair. We actually, we actually do have good qualities. Look at these qualities, build on them, appreciate them. Appreciate them. Sometimes just reflecting on the good qualities that you both have, that brings peace to our relationships. And you can apply this across the board, not just with spouses, with parents and children, with friends. Parents, sometimes they get fed up with their children. Children get fed up with their, with their parents. I can't stand my parents anymore. I can't stand my children anymore. Focus on their good qualities. Don't be stuck on the negatives. None of us here is infallible. We all have our fallacies. Don't zoom on the negative qualities. A mu'min is the one who zooms in on the good qualities. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this beautiful advice. وَلَا تَنْسَوُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Don't forget all the good days with each other. Always reflect on that and be appreciative of each other. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to bless our communities, our marriages, our households. We ask Allah to give us the vision whenever we are in a dispute to navigate these challenges in a way that truly pleases Him.